Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Um, today I'm going to be doing something, as I often do, that I have no right to be doing. The subject today is beam expanders. As I've told you many times before, my qualifications in optical engineering are probably less than zero. I feel a bit like a bumblebee. Nobody's ever told the bumblebee that it can't fly. It doesn't comply with any of the laws of aerodynamics and it certainly wouldn't get an airworthiness certificate. That's me when it comes to optics. Now I'm not particularly promoting this company but if you go and look at Edmunds Optics you see across the bottom there there's a video that tells you all about beam expansion selection and it's a very nice video that explains all about how beam expanders work and I would do that before you watch this video <laughs> because I really don't know how beam expanders work not for these machines and I'm not even sure that Edmunds do either now, that's that sounds a bit frivolous and a bit arrogant but they haven't got any of these cheap laser machines that cut material Beam expansion is a great mechanism for conditioning a beam to improve its engraving capability. I don't think it does anything to improve its cutting ability. And that's what I'm going to try and show you all about today. I'm going to try and improve the quality of a beam to make it cut better. Something I've tried to do before with a compound lens and failed miserably, but it did teach me how lenses work properly, how they cut. My ignorance and my curiosity often can lead me to good places. So let's have a quick look. Why do we need a beam expander? Now regardless of the laser source, and I just happen to have a glass tube here, um, when a beam exits the laser source it isn't, as people imagine, a perfectly parallel beam. Every laser beam has got a tendency to diverge the further it gets away from its source. Now, depending on the type of laser source that you're using, when we're talking about a glass tube, it diverges at the rate of something like 3 millirads. The RF tube is more than twice as bad at 7 millirads. And a fibre laser is somewhere up in the stratosphere. It's ridiculous. As soon as the beam escapes from the end of the fibre, it goes bonkers. All right. So, but the basic idea of a beam expander is to catch it as soon as you can and start conditioning the beam to make it parallel by putting it through various optical stages. Although these look like terrible numbers, the start sizes for these beams do vary. I mean, a fibre laser can be very, very small at about 0.1. So it can expand a lot before it gets up to 5 millimetres, you can see. To be honest, what I'm really interested in is trying to improve the quality of this beam here from 7 millirads to parallel, which I have been able to do with the times 2 beam expander on my RF machine. Now times two means that I've got the beam up to about four millimetres. In fact, it turns out that my beam is physically about six millimetres diameter. But I would like it to be closer to two millimetres by the time it hits mirror three. Let's come back to the glass tube machine, which most of us have got. You won't find beam conditioning systems on a normal glass tube machine. What is this divergence thing called millirads? Well, it's actually pretty simple, really. Look. We've got a beam that's a metre long. It starts off at six millimetres and it grows by three millimetres per metre. It's that simple. So by the time this beam reaches a metre, it's grown from six millimetres to nine millimetres. The RF tube has grown from two millimetres to nine millimetres over the same distance. If you've got a machine which is, say, 600 by 400 millimetres, that's a change of beam length of one metre, a thousand millimetres. So your beam from the back corner of the machine over here to the front corner of the machine 
is going to change in diameter from six millimeters to at least nine millimeters. Now, a subject that we have tackled before is all to do with the laser beam itself. Now, a laser beam is not a uniform beam of light. If we've got a seven millimeter diameter beam, right at the outside of the beam, there is virtually no intensity. It disappears to almost nothing. And yet at the center of the beam, we've got a high intensity. The whole point about this CO2 laser is it does its damage to material by virtue of light intensity. So the more intense the light, the faster it can do damage to material. Exposure time is a term that I've used in the past. So if you've got a very high intense beam, you can do a lot of damage very quickly. But as the intensity drops off, you can do the same amount of damage with half the intensity. But you have to allow twice as long for that intensity to have the same effect. So I think you can fairly quickly see from that that the more intense the beam, the faster we should be able to do our cutting. Okay, so that's that's how intensity affects cutting. You think that when you buy a tube which has got more power to it, you're getting more cutting power. Twice as much power, twice as fast cutting. Well, I'm afraid the rules don't quite work like that. This is a very common but mathematically well-defined shape. This is called a Gaussian distribution, where the light is distributed in a Gaussian form, i.e. there's more at the centre than there is at the edge. The shape itself contains an area. Let's just say we made this 50 millimetres tall. We've got a certain amount of power underneath this curve, which very conveniently I've just said is 50 watts. Now, if I increase the power to 100 watts, what it really means is that I'm going to increase the area under this curve to 100 as opposed to 50. And look, the area here was 1621. And geometrically, I've calculated the area under this one to be 3242, twice as much as that one. We've still got seven millimeters diameter at the base here. But what it's actually done to get twice the area, we've had to make the shape grow. The shape is still the same mathematical shape that it is here, but it's stretched because it's still on the same base seven millimeters diameter. So you've currently got a 50 watt tube and you decide that you're going to go out and buy a 100 watt tube. The thing is, when you look at the specification for a 100 watt tube as opposed to a 50 watt tube, you'll find that the diameter of the beam will be bigger. I've just used these examples here, seven and nine. So this has grown from seven millimeters at 50 watts to nine millimeters at 100 watts. And what that's done, because I've pushed the base out, although I have increased the area from 1621 to 3242, the same as it is here, because I have changed the baseline, the diameter of the beam itself, look what's happened. Although I've doubled the power of my tube from 50 to 100, I haven't doubled its cutting efficiency. The cutting efficiency is dependent upon, upon its peak intensity. And the intensity has only grown from 50 to 77, a gain of 50%. So you've gone double the power, but you've only gained 50% extra cutting capability. <laughs> That's an important concept when it comes to thinking about your machine as a cutting tool. So continuing on with that theme for a minute, what we've got here is basically that same Gaussian shape. Okay, now I'm going to assume this diagram means two things. First of all, let's assume we've got a certain power of laser with this lovely shape of Gaussian distribution. If I try and burn a piece of material with this beam, after one second, I will maybe have produced that much damage. Because remember, the damage at the center is greater than the damage at the edge. As I expose my material to this laser beam, it's going to do more damage at the center of the beam than it is at the edge of the beam. And then I expose it for two seconds and I get a further stretch. So what happens is as I expose my material to the beam for more and more seconds, look what happens. I've, this is basically turning into a very sharp 
beam. And that's what a Gaussian distribution will do if you leave it to damage a piece of material. It will damage the centre of the material a lot quicker than it will damage the edge where there's no power at all. So if you have a laser beam which is a non-Gaussian distribution like this, let's call it a molehill here, um, you can do the same trick with it. You can expose it for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten seconds and look what you get. You get a very blunt beam as opposed to what I will call a sharp beam. What, what's all this got to do with beam expansion? It's got a lot to do with this and this. We've got a laser beam which starts off at six millimeters diameter and it finishes up at nine millimeters diameter. Hang about. So the cutting ability of that beam is changing because look we've got 50 watts here with this area and we've still got 50 watts here. I've got the same area as this but it's now spread over nine millimeters diameter rather than seven millimeters diameter. So I'm losing cutting power because my beam is expanding. And there is a way of seeing the intensity distribution within your beam and that's by firing it at a block of acrylic. Now normally I do this on a piece of a sample here which is 25 millimeters wide. As you can see this is a 70 watt beam which is would be fired into that block and it would just about go right through the block in 10 seconds. I give that to you just as a an example because although this is a very large picture that I've got here this is the same one inch block 25 millimeters. Hang on this is a tube which is twice the power of mine. This is a 130 watt tube and right at the back corner of the machine over there this is the mode burn. Okay, 130 watts didn't make it through despite what the claim is for it, 130 watts. The facts tell me this is not delivering 130 watts. This is only delivering maybe 70 or 80 watts, much the same as my tube. This exact same tube a few seconds later was tested at the front right hand corner of the machine. Now this is quite a big machine. I think it's probably something like a maybe a two meter path change between the back corner and the front corner. And this is what that mode burn looks like at the front corner. Look at the way in which the diameter of the beam has changed from here at the back corner to the front corner. And look at look at the effect that it's had on the ability of the intensity the intensity has been wrecked because otherwise it would still be out here. This is the same tube power in two different places around the machine and the only reason that this is no longer looking like that is because of beam expansion. The bigger your machine the bigger your problem. This Gaussian curve as I said is mathematically defined and is the ideal shape of distribution of intensity within the beam for a perfect laser beam. Now the quality of a beam is defined by this number here, this m squared number. If it complies perfectly with the Gaussian distribution it's classed as an m squared of 1 which means all the beam is usable and we get a power of whatever it is, say 1. If the beam starts to degrade this number here starts to increase. We've got to increase the power by 20% to get the same performance as if we had the perfect laser beam. And then similarly here we are look at 1.6 and we've got to use two and a half times as much power to get the same performance as the perfect beam. Here's a couple of examples. Look the red beam here is m2 equals m squared equals 1. So this is the perfect Gaussian distribution and here we've got two examples of a 1.6, a, a really terrible blunt beam. 
as you can see here, look, this beam is much, much larger than this beam, perfect beam here. If we were to regard that as being the same power as this, and we change the shape of that to match the power of this, in other words, the area under this curve to match the area under this blue curve, the blue curve would be down here somewhere like this. It would be a very blunt curve where the intensity is suppressed. The same applies to this one. Look, we've got a terrible shape here. Okay, it may have a peak, but it's to one side. That's a pretty bad shaped beam. Now, I've seen that sort of beam on my RF machine. So, this is not an unrealistic situation. I've shown you what damage a near perfect quality beam can be. The, the bottom of those two is somewhere between zero and 1.1. So it's pretty close to a perfect beam. So you shouldn't expect anything worse than that. This is a, a Resi W6 130 watt tube. 10 seconds. Look, this is only a 20 millimeter test piece, not a 25 millimeter test piece. And look, it's hardly make it through to what, maybe eight millimeters deep. I mean, this is absolute junk. <laughs> and here we've got another Resi W4, worse than junk. This is what I mean about the quality of the beam. The idea of a lens is to amplify the intensity. And if you've got rubbish in, you're going to get rubbish out. It's as simple as that. Having understood a bit about the beam itself, what we're ideally trying to do is we're trying to control the diameter of the beam so that it does not change its diameter. So we've got ideally 50 watts of intensity here and 50 watts of intensity here. So the cutting capability at both corners of your machine remains constant. So what's the idea of a beam expander? Well, a beam expander tries to get rid of this divergence. I'm just going to draw these as very simple lenses, but they're not. You have to go and look at the um, Edmonds optics to see exactly what sort of lenses they use to control the size of the beam. There are two lenses basically in the system. As you can see, from my very simple diagram there. Look, we had, we had pretty rubbish cutting over this corner of the machine and good cutting over here, okay? So what we've done, we've compromised it now. We've got a parallel beam. Yes, we've got the same cutting ability over the whole machine, but we've got rubbish cutting over here and now we've got rubbish cutting over here. We've got a lovely parallel beam, but that hasn't really fixed our problem. What we really want to do is we want good cutting here and good cutting here. Now, to be fair, this has the effect of making the beam very good for engraving. This is a typical lens that we would find in our machine. It's a plano convex lens. And you can see the, the correct way to use this lens is this way round with the flat side downwards towards the work because it's been designed so that the rays come in parallel like this. And then they pass through the zinc selenide and they finish up being refracted in different directions as they pass through. Now, because this shape here is part of a sphere, this automatically produces something called spherical aberration. And spherical aberration is this really strange effect that you can see down here. The rays that are coming in from the outside, if you look, are crossing over and focusing at this point. Whereas the rays that are coming down the center are focusing more at this point. So there is a range of focus depending on where the rays happen to pass through the lens. So this aberration is the sort of thing that you do not want on a telescope, a microscope, a camera, or a projector lens. This is because this will produce fuzzy pictures because there isn't a focal point. Our light is very intense at the center. And so that means our very, very intense light is passing through here at a focal point, which is different 
to the rays that are coming in from the outer part. So there's a filtering effect through this lens which allows our very, very high intensity rays to pass right down the centre here and maybe do their focusing at a point significantly beyond the point where the manufacturer thinks the focal point is. So there's a focal point of light and there's a focal point of intensity. And I'm pretty convinced that the beam expanders that are there on the market at the moment are all based on the focal point of light, not the focal point of intensity. Two completely different things. Focusing an image and focusing a, an, an intense part of the beam is a significantly different problem. So my goal, my dream, is to try and finish up with at least a one-to-one -one beam expander. In other words, no expansion at all, but a parallel beam. Ideally, I'd like to finish up with a 0.5 beam expander, taking this six millimeter beam down to three millimeter parallel beam to run round the machine. And that means I will then have been able to increase the cutting power of my machine by a factor of two. Now that's a silly dream because nobody else has been able to achieve that. You cannot buy a 0.5 beam expander. That brings me round full circle to this idea of the bumblebee and my total ignorance of optics. What I'm suggesting is not possible, but maybe it is, if we ignore the rules. Now I'm gonna be using this machine for real to find out what's happening to lenses. And to do that, I've made myself a little jig that fits over the back of the rail. And the idea is that what I'm gonna be do doing is using various lenses in here and playing with the distance between the lenses to see if I can get some sort of uh, collimation from different types of lens. And then we're gonna be firing at, when it's close here, and when it's about 500 millimetres further away. So we should get a bit of an idea of whether or not I'm in any way succeeding, because we should get the same sort of size burn, ideally, at both situations, or if I'm even lucky, we might get a smaller one here and here as well. From all my previous experimentation with lenses, I know that 63.5 gallium arsenide lens is one of the few lenses that seems to have a focal point for various speeds and powers that doesn't change by a great deal. It's where the manufacturer said it should be, 63.5. And my initial thought was, this is easy. 63.5 gallium arsenide lens, 63.5 gallium arsenide lens, look, if it comes out of a 63.5 gallium arsenide lens like that and reaches the focal point, then we've got a good focal point. I should be able to pick the same rays up here and they will be smaller, like this. So I start off at six and finish up at three. What a great dream. Unfortunately, when you start looking at it a little bit closely, that isn't the way that it works. Look, can you see this ray here? I've tra transferred this ray to an input rather than an output. And if I use it as an input, look what happens. It focuses down to 63.5 at an angle of say 10 degrees, as opposed to rays from the outside, which are focusing down at 20 degrees included angle. So once I pass the focal point, what's this angle here? It's 20 degrees. And I'm hitting the surface here at the same diameter as I am here. But in this instance, I'm hitting the surface at 10 degrees, not 20 degrees. So my dream is absolute rubbish. It's not going to work. So what's going to happen in this instance is because I've got this angle and a much larger angle than it should be, this beam is actually going to expand rapidly. This picture tells me that what we really ought to be doing is using something like a two and a half inch lens to start with and maybe 
something like a one and a half or one inch lens because we've now got a very short focal length here and so what we've got to do we've got to match this focal length so that I can pick up this beam at smaller distance and produce this smaller output diameter. So there is a hundred millisecond burn right up against the edge of the V block. Let's just do the same thing again with nothing, this is just the system, this is no, nothing interfering with the beam at all. And there we go, we've got a perfect beam alignment. Well, you can see that the two beams line up perfectly. So what I'm now going to do is to change the system very slightly. We now do a burn this end and I'll measure the diameter of the burn. the other end of the stroke. Well there's our two numbers 480 millimeter travel 4.6 to 5.4 which is a point zero which is a point eight growth. So we have a thousand which is one meter divide that by 480 okay that's 2.08 multiply that by 0.8 And that's pretty damn good. That's 1.7 millirads, which is well inside the specification. Well inside the specification, which is why this machine is particularly good. <laughs> so what I've now got, I've got a, a, I've got a one and a half inch meniscus lens in there with the meniscus side facing inwards because meniscus lens has got a sharper focal point than a normal plano convex. And then I've got my two and a half inch gallium arsenide lens in here. So two and a half plus one and a half, ideally that ought to be four inches apart. 101.6 apart. Well, that's not a disaster. And we're not interested in concentricity. We're interested in size change. Despite the fact they don't line up, they are actually looking to be the same size. Let me just measure what the diameter is. Remember, it was 4.6 before. Now it's 3. Point, just about 4.0. So, wow. I'm not sure it's well lined up, but that's not the point. We're interested in size, not alignment at the moment. So what we now do, we'll change that distance between those lenses by two millimeters? There we go, 103.6. That looks smaller and I can see it's smaller because it's blown a hole through the middle which means there's more power there. Whoa, 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 wow! It has gone smaller. So increasing the distance has made it smaller. Let me decrease the distance from 101.6 to 99.6 and let me try again. Is that going to make that bigger? Which I expect it will do. Yes, it has. Which is great news. Hey, there's a possibility here, a very distinct possibility that putting two lenses perfectly back to back at their correct focal distance may well give me a lovely parallel beam. Now how I'm going to put it into the system I don't know. There might be room between mirrors one and two which is a good idea. So let me set that back to 101.6 one there. I have an assembly there that's probably maybe two millimetres short of what it should be and two millimetres short should give me a slightly smaller mark than those that are on there. Okay let's see what we get. They're looking about the same size aren't they? About 3.8 and 3.8. So 
So they're pretty well spot on and about 0.8 smaller than our reference. Well, I'm not going to knock that. Now the question is, using that same principle, can I use different lenses to get the same result but using a shorter, more compact system? We've got something that works, which, hey, <laughs> this is the bumblebee flying. <laughs> it's always pleasing to know that you can do something that you've told is not possible. And so we're going to go one step further now and I'm going to pull this down from four inches to two and a half inches with a one and a half inch CVD meniscus lens and a one inch PVD. I don't have a one inch CVD otherwise I would have used that. Because it's a fairly short focal length I've been able to jiggle the lenses into one lens tube now so they're all nicely lined up. So because everything is lined up hopefully I should get two coincident marks this time. And there we go. So now we'll try and measure the size and what I'm going to do is put one pulse here to make sure the pulses are slightly different than each other what I'm going to do is just very carefully lift the front of that up and that should put the second pulse above the first pulse which it has done. The first one is about 3.8 and the second one is about 4.0 so I could adjust that second one down to 3.8. There's another skeleton in the cupboard here which I think I've just uncovered. Lenses are designed with rays that are parallel to the axis of the lens. We've got a diverging beam which means that very few of the rays that are hitting that lens are actually parallel to the axis. That's the theoretical way in which lenses are designed and if you change the angle of these rays coming in it changes the focal distance and in fact those rays will cause the focal distance to increase and if you put the rays the other way like this which I have done when I put another lens in front of that it shortens the focal distance. Lots of little problems here to think about but finally back to this thing that um, I've just done which I shouldn't be able to do um, because lens theory tells me I can't do that either I'm doing some fiddling on the video or perhaps the rules aren't quite as rigid as they believe they are. I've been able to get a naked beam which starts off at 4.6 to start off at about 3.8 and finish at 3.8. I know it isn't at the moment but I could make that 3.8 to match that perfectly. I've made the beam parallel and I've made it 0.8 smaller. I'll leave you to think about that one because I might try and go away and find a way to see if I can mount this between mirrors one and two for a future session. I've got to think about the design of that but this looks a very interesting possibility. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm afraid we haven't got an absolute conclusion but we've got a very interesting conclusion and I'll catch up with you in the next session.